In this lecture, we're going to look at our third macronutrient, which is dietary protein. As a review, each gram of dietary protein that you eat in your diet contains four calories per gram. It's similar in caloric contribution to carbohydrates. In the United States and in most developed countries, protein deficiency is very rare. Two-thirds of the protein in the diets of people in the United States come from animal foods, meat, poultry, seafood, eggs, and dairy. In the developing world, the, sh the mix is a little bit shifted in the sense that the developing world countries tend to rely more heavily on plant proteins. We know that as a population's economic status improves, there is a consequent increase in the proportion of animal protein that they consumed. And you'll see that animal proteins tend to have more of those unhealthy fats and contribute more to overweight and obesity. So it's unfortunate that the more developed or rich a country becomes, actually, the poorer their diet becomes. What does protein do in our diet or in our body? Protein does a number of things. The enzymes in your bodies that are required to make chemical reactions occur are actually proteins. Your hormones, your antibodies, and transport proteins are all examples of proteins as well. Protein helps you to maintain your fluid and your electrolyte balance. It maintains acid-base balance, promotes the growth, the maintenance, and the repair of your body tissues. It also gives you energy, four calories per gram and in certain cases can actually provide you glucose through the process of what's called gluconeogenesis. New meaning, neo meaning new, and genesis meaning to make. Your body can, although it would prefer not to, to break down dietary or body proteins in order to make glucose. Amino acids are the building blocks of protein. And amino acids are linked together by what are called peptide bonds. If you have two amino acids joined together, that's a dipeptide. Three amino acids joined together is a tripeptide, and more than three is what's called a polypeptide. Again, amino acids are linked by what are called peptide bonds. Here you see an example of, amino, of an amino acid. An amino acid contains an amine group. An amine means nitrogen containing. So your proteins are unique and different from carbs and fats in the sense that they're the only macronutrient that contains nitrogen. You've got your amino group here, an acid group here, and a hydrogen group here. All amino acids have those same three components. What makes an amino acid unique is what's called its side chain. A side chain is unique to each amino acid. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. There are essential and non-essential amino acids. When we study nutrition, if we say something is essential, what that means is that it has to be consumed in the diet because your body can't make it. So we've got nine essential amino acids. And when you eat different plant or animal proteins, they contain a mix of those essential amino acids. Again, you have to eat those in your diet because your body doesn't have the ability to make them. There are four non-essential amino acids, which if you eat the right mix of essential, your body uses components of those in order to make the non-essential amino acids inside your body. We also have what are called conditionally essential amino acids or conditional amino acids. The Institute of Medicine and the Food and Nutrition Board in the United States say that these eight amino acids are ordinarily made by the body, so they're ordinarily non-essential amino acids, except in time of illness or stress, they become what are called conditionally essential amino acids. Your body can, although it would prefer not to, utilize the proteins in your body to be broken down to provide energy. Now, in a perfect situation when you're healthy, you get the majority of your calories from carbohydrates. But if for whatever reason, perhaps you were on a very restrictive diet, if you didn't get enough calories to meet your body's needs, your body would break down its body proteins. And that would happen because you don't actually store amino acids. There is no storage mechanism for amino acids. You store extra carbohydrate as glycogen. And if your body's glycogen stores get full up, then you start storing it as fat. If you have excessive amounts of protein in your diet, your body can't store those amino acids. Nitrogen makes up about 16% of the weight of protein, and that's similar to the Earth's atmosphere. So if you have an individual who weighs 170 pounds, that body is made up of about 16% protein. So about 27 pounds plus water makes up 70% of the rest of that body weight. 
half of your body's total protein is used to form your skeletal muscles. So it's important that you eat the right mix of dietary protein so that your body can promote the optimal ability to build body proteins inside of you. Protein is the only macronutrient that contains nitrogen. Nitrogen is in the amino group. This is the amino group, meaning that it's nitrogen containing. The process of deamination is what your body goes through in order to remove that amine or that nitrogen containing component. Nitrogen plays an important role and it's a big component of your urea. Urea is a waste product which your body excretes in your urine. So your body uses the nitrogen for a number of different processes to build body proteins. But at the end of the day, it really essentially is a waste product. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen can be broken down in order to produce ATP, which is a form of cellular energy, or it can be used to make glucose or fatty acids. We would prefer, again, that you get the majority of your calories from carbohydrate, but in extreme cases, if you do need to use protein to provide your body with energy, it can be done, although it occurs in a relatively metabolically inefficient way. In our diets, we get protein from both animal and plant sources. Dairy foods contain protein, milk, yogurt, and cheese. Animal flesh from things like poultry, meat, and fish do, as do legumes, nuts, and eggs. Grains contain a little bit of protein, although they tend to be incomplete proteins. And an incomplete protein is one that does not contain all of the essential amino acids. Vegetables also have incomplete sources of protein, but you get a few grams of protein here and there from different vegetables. We say that soy is the only non-animal complete source of protein. Again, a complete protein is one that provides you with all of the essential amino acids. Sometimes you hear people say, well, I've heard that there's other non-animal sources of protein. Soy is not the only one. What about foods like quinoa, buckwheat, hemp seed, and amaranth? These are very high protein grains that also in some situations can be considered to be complete proteins. They do contain all of the essential amino acids, but after you eat them and digest them, all of those essential amino acids are not actually available to your body for use. So there's a scale called the Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Scale, and quinoa, buckwheat, hemp seed, and amaranth, while again, they're very high protein foods, don't register 1.0 which is a complete protein on that scale. So they're certainly good sources of protein, but it is safe and most health professionals and scientists would agree that soy continues to remain the only complete source of protein that's not an animal protein. Animal sources of protein, we said they come from milk. A cup of milk gives you eight grams of protein. An egg gives you about six grams of protein. And three ounces of meat gives you about 20 grams of protein. So in a very small amount of animal foods in your diet, you actually can amass a pretty decent amount of protein. But that's not the only place you get protein in your diet. Plants also give you protein. Now, the serving sizes of plants give you less grams of protein per serving, but the reality is, is that most people in the developed world eat too much protein. One slice of bread gives you two grams of protein. A half a cup of beans, somewhere between six to 10 grams. A half a cup of rice, cereal, pasta, two to three grams. And then a quarter of a cup of nuts or seeds is five to 10 grams. So you can see that per serving, the plant foods generally have less protein. But again, most of us don't need as much protein. And in turn, we don't need as many animal foods as you might have previously thought. What are the recommended serving sizes for proteins? You go to a steakhouse and you sit down and sometimes the smallest steak you can order is eight ounces, a filet. Occasionally you can get a six ounce petite filet. But did you know that you really only need about two to three ounces of cooked lean meat, things like poultry and fish, to give in some cases almost half the amount of protein that you need in a day? A half a cup of dried beans as a serving, one egg, two tablespoons of peanut butter, one ounce of cheese, and if you're curious what an ounce is, it's about the size of a domino or if you buy prepackaged sliced cheeses, um, it's the, that size as well. That's one ounce. 
two to three ounces of soy protein, soybeans, or meat alternatives. These are all what we call a serving size of protein. How much protein do we need? Well, 10 to 35% of your total calories should be coming from protein. If you're significantly under 10, you're probably not getting all of the essential amino acids you need. And if you're way over 35, it means you're probably not getting enough fat or enough carbohydrate. In the United States, the average person eats somewhere between 12 to 18% of their calories from protein. Protein needs vary dependent upon what life stage you're in. As a percentage of your body weight, when you're young, a baby, a child, and even an adolescent, you're growing at a more rapid rate than you are when you're pretty well developed as an adult. So you can see that in the developmental stages of life, as a function of grams of protein required per kilogram of body weight, needs are higher in the earlier stages of life. By the time you're an adult, 18 years and older, provided that you're not pregnant or breastfeeding, you need 0.8 grams of protein for every kilogram of body weight that you are. Then during pregnancy and breastfeeding, protein needs for females go up. But most adults, we say the RDA, which is the recommended dietary allowance for protein, is 0.8 grams per kilogram. And in case you're not sure, one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds. So take a moment to figure out for yourself, based on the 0.8 grams per kilogram, how many grams of protein you need per day. There are certainly other scientific bodies out there besides the Institute of Medicine, and protein recommendations vary and tend to be a little bit controversial. Older adults who are engaged in resistance training might actually have higher protein needs, 1 to 1.3 grams per kilogram. Athletes tend to be on the higher side as well, 0.9 to 1.3 grams per kilogram. So in addition to the life stage that you're at, your activity level, um, how much exercise you do, what disease states you have, these all may increase your dietary protein needs. The British Department of Health and World Cancer Research Fund recommends and puts specific guidelines out there for how much meat we should be eating. We know that excessive amounts of protein from animal foods contributes a lot of other nutrients that we sometimes don't need so much of. This groups recommend no more than two and a half ounces of red meat per day and no more than one pound of red meat per week. There are certain groups that need higher protein, 